the cause and cure of bruxing and clinching. These are issues that cause a lot of concern to quite a lot of people. And I think it's getting worse. These cause problems like headaches, jaw joint problems, and even dental wear. And there's a lot of discussion within dentistry about why these problems are caused and a lot of interesting treatments. The treatments seem to be um, splints. Um, people put splints, whether they are um, hard splints, um, like we have up on the top diagram, or soft splints down on the bottom right hand side. And the hard splints are often finely adjusted as you can see down on the bottom left, using basically carbon paper, where you bite together, that you can then make marks on the splint where the teeth touch the splint and they can be ground so that you can get sort of balances between the um, jaws, the upper jaw or lower jaw, doesn't matter which side the splint goes, can um, have the teeth adjusted so that they meet the splint in a smooth way so you can move well. Some people say a smooth way with non-working side or working side contacts or there's, there's a canine guidance group function. There's lots of different ideas behind how you can adjust these splints to correct um, the sort of or improve the habits or the, the stimulus that lead to bruxism. It, there's, a, there's a great deal of disagreement. My concern about a lot of these appliances is, of course, that they can occupy tongue space. And some of the soft ones, they can actually almost encourage chewing. You know, put something that is chewy between the teeth of a chewer and they may well chew on it. And that could be counterproductive. So the suggestion, it's that we're overworking our chewing muscles. And the uh, recommendations are often to hold the teeth apart, whether that relates to a splints or not. There's some debate on that. Um, sometimes you have these reflex liberating splints where you overstimulate one or two of the teeth, usually the lower front, small teeth, so they surpass their load threshold, which I'll mention later, so that that sends a reflex back to cause jaw opening or at least a reduction in the jaw closing. Um, but people are asked to avoid holding their teeth in contact and of course avoid holding chewing, chewing gum or excessive use of their jaw muscles. And I guess if you've got problems and you've got damage in the jaw joints, that I guess is not a bad idea. But that's not normal state of affairs, so that's dealing with a pathological situation. What should we normally do, particularly if we don't have problems? Well, when we're talking about the disuse theories, so we're saying um, you, we're overusing our, our chewing muscles, it, it's interesting to reflect back to see what our ancestors did. It's important to remember that we've been anatomical humans for 220,000 years. And there's no evidence, and also when you um, uh, look at indigenous populations, there's no reported symptoms of clenching or bruxing. It seems to be a modern problem. Now, it does interest me that indigenous and ancient man had a great deal of wear. They wore their teeth down heavily. Not one or two of them, but they all did that. I mean, here's an image of an, um, a relatively modern Aboriginal and some teeth from a um, preserved skull. Both of them have a great deal of wear on them. And it's interesting because there's a whole science um, that is, is formed relating to what we would term as attrition. Attrition is tooth on tooth wear. And it's interesting because, of course, we know approximately when the teeth should erupt. So your first lower molar is coming up soon after six years old, then your 12-year-old molar coming up at 12-year-old, and your wisdom tooth would come up around 18 in, in historical societies. It was fairly consistently around 18. I know people don't tend to, well, they tend to be very delayed or they don't come up at all in modern era. But when you had this 
um, fairly consistent pattern where the six-year-old molar arrived at six, the 12-year-old molar arrived at 12, and the wisdom tooth arrived at 18, you could use the difference between the wear on these individual teeth to work out roughly how old the individual was. And it seemed fairly consistent, and as mentioned by um, Brothwell here, it was unfortunate that the rates of wear were fairly consistent between the Neolithic to the medieval times. So right up to the medieval times, this seems to have been quite a normal pattern. And it was used to, to measure the um, age of skulls. And an interesting quote, I, um, I can't find the exact source of this, but I remember someone saying this quote to me, it says, it was not uncommon for the lower first molar, tooth number six, or the six-year-old molar, same tooth, to break into its separate roots in the middle of the fourth decade of life. So that's where the tooth has worn so far that the roots, you reach the root level, you, you wear through the tooth till you've only got the three roots or two roots in the lower um, present. Now that's a huge amount of wear, that's a vast amount of wear, but basically it's clear to say that our ancestors had a, a lot of wear, a really large amount of wear, and they didn't get bruxism or clenching to our knowledge. So, is clinching and bruxism related to overactivity of the muscles? Well, possibly. But I think it's a little bit more complex, and as with many things, I don't think anyone out there is completely wrong. It's just a little bit more complex, and sometimes you need to look at the slightly more complex answer. It's interested me that all skeletal muscles that cross a joint are arranged in antagonistic pairs or groups. All of them. You don't have muscles that just work on one side of a joint. It, it wouldn't work. You would, you would have no control. Um, of course, the classic example is the biceps and your triceps. And it interests me that, of course, I can use my biceps and triceps and I can move my arm up. Because as I do that, I'm clearly using my bicep, but the triceps is also working. It's not that this muscle isn't being used at all. It's controlling it. it it's slowing down and regulating the action of my bicep. So both muscles work there in a nice antagonism. And of course, they'll work in an antagonism in this orientation and they'll work in antagonism in this orientation. And by and large, Apart from the physical weight of my forearm, I don't really perceive any difference. It, it, it seems more or less the same to me. And that's a lot of this is because I've got some neural control going on. It's going on in at my, the level of my spine. And that's really controlling, you know, not only the uh, regulation, but also the overactivity, underactivity, you know. It's controlling the muscles in such a way that I don't really think about what I'm doing. I'm just saying, move out, move back. Move out, move back, move out, move back. And it works it out for me. There's no point. There's no point in bothering my higher centers with this sort of thing. It's a very similar, in a way, to when you um, have a pain reflex when you burn yourself. So you touch a hot thing. Um, the pain, well, there's no point in the pain going all the way up to your head, you thinking about it, oh yeah, it's burning, I mean, I'll be smelling barbecue by the time that happens. No, you want an instantaneous reflex reaction, so you put your, your finger or hand or whatever's being burnt straight away from the source so that you have, you, so you protect yourself. I and mean, you need that, that's a reflex that goes on. Um, now, it interests me, I remember someone hearing telling me that dinosaurs had many brains. Now, that's not entirely true. They only have one place they think in. But of course, a lot of this local regulation can be farmed out. It can be housed further down their body. And of course, when you've got something quite that long, it's a sensible thing to do, because the time lag of coming up to your brain and all the way back again would cause you lots of problems. In fact, it could also almost occur um, 
a sort of levels of resonance going on within the system that could be quite damaging. So it is interesting that people have identified the potential of hind brains spaced about the um, by, by the limbs in the um, spinal cord area of some dinosaurs. Now, I've heard many people say that the masseter is the strongest muscle in the body. Now, weight for weight, any cubic millimetre of muscle is the same as any other cubic millimetre of muscle by and large. I mean, there are slightly different types of muscles, but if we're talking about voluntary striated muscle, they're all about the same. Now, there are different orientations, and here it describes uh, three of the classical types of levers. Now, most muscles work as a class one lever. So, um, for example, well, for example, my elbow, the, um, the, 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 the tricep pulls on the bit of my elbow that's this side of the joint and the force is produced at some distance on the other side of the joint, hinging around in the centre of the joint, like a classic class 1 lever working at a disadvantage in this situation. Now, of course, the um, masseter is different. The masseter is working at um, a well, it was slight disadvantage, but not nearly such a disadvantage. So, if we look at these different types of muscles, you've got the knee, where the quadriceps works at about a 25 to 1 disadvantage, which gives more range but less force. Of course, the biggest muscle in your body, the glutes, is working there across your hip at about a 10 to 1 disadvantage. Um, which gives it less range, but of course, some enormous power. You know, you can wear a big rucksack, or can you carry someone else, and you can go from a squat and you can stand up. That's your glutes, that's your 10 to 1 um, advantage or disadvantage on that lever arm. Now, your masseter, well, that's working as a class 3 lever, and well, if you think your joints here, your muscles here, your foods here, or even further back when you're using a back tooth. So you can work at a 1 to 2 mechanical disadvantage, which is far more, so you can apply far more applicable power using the muscles than in any other part of your body. So it's not that the masseters or the temporalis, the jaw closing muscles, are any stronger, it's just that they can apply more force, more power, because of the way they're set up. Now, we've got these very large muscles that are able to apply a lot of power, a lot of force. Now, what's their antagonist? So, if I've thought that all of these muscles have antagonists, what is the antagonistic muscle to calm, to regulate, to govern and control these big chewing muscles, or the closing chewing muscles. Well, I don't think it's any of these muscles. These are all small muscles, they're not in the right orientation, they're not really set up in the right place. Um, it's important I make the point that we're not talking about when we're actually chewing. This is when you've got your mouth closed, this is in your sort of homeostatic, your sort of maintenance, your postural position. As soon as you start chewing, it's a different situation. But people aren't clenching in a chewing cycle. People are clenching when they're at rest. And this is embruxing, this is the problem. So, you've got these great big muscles. I mean, they're, they're, they're chunky muscles. So, what are the antagonists? Where are the antagonists of this muscle? Well, I can only imagine that the antagonistic muscle for the jaw closing muscles would be the tongue. I mean, it is one of the largest muscles by size, by bulk, whatever, however you mention it, uh, measure it, within the craniofacial structure, within the skull or head really at all. Um, and also it's arranged in a good position, it's very central, you've got the force of the jaw closing muscles either side, you've got the tongue in the middle, it, it, it's my likely candidate for the antagonistic muscles for the jaw closing muscles when at rest, the homeostasis of rest. Um, and, you know, it's the right size, it's the right bulk, it's the right position. Now, okay, 
this is a system, what can go wrong with that system? Well, I have, well, my, one of my main theses is the concept of craniofacial dystrophy, and it describes how modern faces are literally changing shape. And of course, something that isn't the right shape probably doesn't work as well. But also, something that's not fulfilling its function can lead to a cascade of functional problems. Uh, the concept mainly we've had a major change in diet. We've gone from an incredibly tough, hard, low calorie diet to a very soft, high calorie diet, just as we need less calories. And also, we've changed our posture. We've gone from a really good posture to a really bad posture, not only using phones and sitting and uh, computers and, you know the things that drive poor posture, but of course we're getting nasal obstructions and that's leading to poor postures. And of course we're having this epidemic of allergies, crooked teeth and crowded teeth. Um, now, the, 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 the big element out of that is of course getting blocked noses. Allergies are going up at an epidemic level and as epidemic levels as this occurs, we get transitory blocked noses. Now, if you have a blocked nose, you're faced with two options. Either you separate your lips, you lower your tongue off the roof of your mouth, and you open your mouth to breathe, or you die. There are no alternatives. Now, I think one of the big problems here is what starts as necessity can become habit. And I'm surprised how high an open mouth posture, but particularly a low tongue posture is. Because you can have your lips closed, but still have a low tongue posture. And of course, this is in a world where we've all got soft food, so the jaw muscles actually aren't working nearly as much as they should be. Now, when we get this um, lowering of the tongue, it allows a reduction in the tongue space because the, the maxilla collapses, also because we're not um, exerting as much force through the whole system. And of course, you then get a narrow palate. Now that's only one of the angles which we can look at a reduction in tongue space because the maxilla is also dropping down and back, it's getting narrower, it's getting shorter. But clearly, one of the obvious signs is a narrow maxilla. And it's estimated that our ancestors had an intermolar width, so the clear width, the, when you look at the, the narrow palate, the, the, the bottom line here, that's the intermolar width. Whereas our ancestors had an intermolar width in the sort of low 50s, we now have an intermolar width in the low 30s. And that has happened relatively quickly. So you can go back to those um, medieval skulls and they tend to have an intermolar width of not far off the low 50s, or at least high 40s. And we've got a gross reduction so that most people now have an intermolar width in the sort of low 30s. And that is a significant change. And of course, if one of the causes of this is the tongue has dropped down, once you've lost space, it's very difficult to get the tongue back up there, so it can easily become a vicious cycle. Now, you then make compensations, because you can't have your tongue pushed down into your airway, so you want to make a compensation for your airway. And one of the compensations you can make is to move some of the bulk of your tongue out between your teeth. I mean, this top image here is a relatively mild illustration. I see people who have the tongue right between their teeth. And of course you get this classic marking on the sides of the tongue. And of course, usually the teeth should move, touch the opposing teeth. And of course, if you have your tongue between your teeth, this thing's going to happen. The teeth are going to move to fit the tongue. And the sort of pattern of the tongue you've got between the teeth. They're not going to move to fit the other teeth. So it's easy then, well it's likely that when you bring your teeth together they won't fit together perfectly and you get what's known as premature contacts. Some bits that touch a little bit earlier than other bits. Of course then the tongue's not on the roof of your mouth. 
And if the tongue's not on the roof of your mouth, it's not acting as a natural antagonist to the jaw closing muscles. And of course also, because your tongue's wedged between the teeth, most of the time, that becomes your habitual postural position. As such, being dynamic people, individuals, dynamic organisms, the jaw joint will reform so that it's balanced with the teeth slightly apart. The yeah, jaw gape, you leave them. And then it's not particularly balanced when you bring your teeth together, as we'll come to. But this position picture of a tongue with scalloping on it, it's kind of classic. It's a classic sign that your tongue's between your teeth. I remember when I was young and we didn't have seat belts in the back of the seat, I'd lie down on the um, seat, have a snooze, you'd wake up, are we there yet? And I'd have Lancia written in reverse on the side of my face from where the, I'd been lying on the seat. Or, you know, if you have a very heavy night's sleep, you can wake up with the marks of your sheets on the side of your face. Clearly, what we've got here is the tongue forming to the position of the teeth, forming to the shape of the teeth where it's wedged in between. Um, we referred to as tongue splinting. Now, there is another mechanism preventing you chewing or you biting too hard on your teeth. Clearly the body's full of mechanisms, usually pain mechanisms, to prevent you damaging it. And this, um, I was taught as the, 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 the buckshot reflex, is what we were taught. So that if you get a little bit of buckshot, uh, as highlighted, between these rather original teeth, um, and the classic example is you're, you're eating a pheasant or some game that's been shot by um, buckwheat, and it has happened to me once. My um, uncle used to be in a hunt, and you're chewing some meat, and all of a sudden you have a bit of buckwheat that gets in between your teeth, and your whole masticatory symphony stops like that. It's actually quite amazing. When you think your teeth are passing across each other with tens, twenties, thirty kilos force, they never touch. So there's a very small elements of um, error going on. And all of a sudden, this whole system that's been working away stops like that. Now, it stops because as you bite down, you hit the buck shot. That buckshot pushes more on one tooth, because clearly your other teeth haven't touched together or touched onto anything yet. That overloads a single tooth, and that then sends a feedback mechanism down to switch off the chewing mechanism. Now, that's clearly an overload mechanism. Now, we've got, well, we should have 32 teeth in the mouth. Most people actually only have 28 teeth in the mouth or less. A lot of people with only 24 teeth in the mouth. and heading south. So, if the overload mechanism of one individual tooth, let's say, is a couple of kilos, if we were to add up all of the overload thresholds for all of the teeth in your mouth, that would add up to be quite a large force. A lot of kilos, let's say, lots of kilos. So, if you're gonna, if your teeth fit reasonably well, all right, you might have a few premature contacts, but remember teeth move a little bit as you bite them together. As you bring your teeth together, and then move around to take the force, you're gonna exert a lot of kilos before you start exceeding the threshold of this whole group together, all of your teeth together. So there's a lot of force before this mechanism will kick in. This mechanism is not really designed to gain fine control of you bringing your teeth together. So if you don't have the normal antagonistic mechanism, normal uh, governing system working, and you bring your teeth in contact, you will have to exceed a great threshold before a great number of kilos before the threshold of overloading surpassed um, and you could cause a lot of damage with this, this level of um, force. Now of course they, we have systems 
of feedback. This is the classic feedback system. This is a governor. They were developed when we had steam engines. So um, the faster this spindle goes round, the faster the um, rod in the middle goes round, the more these weights move outwards. And the more these weights move out, the more the lower um, collar moves up. And that can be attached to something. And that attachment then slows down the steam engine. And this is the way you maintain a constant speed speed with your early mechanisms. Um, and if you didn't have this, then the steam engine could go faster and faster and faster and it would bake itself into parts. It would, it would fall apart. Of course, there's another governor filling a sort of similar role. But of course, what we're able to do is without the tongue on the roof acting as a natural antagonist, it's like we're shoveling coal into our steam engine. We've removed the governor, thrown it away, and it's going faster and faster and faster. We're putting more and more coal in because we're stressed in our modern lifestyle. This is all the extra coal going in. And we're able to exert huge forces. We can maintain these huge forces for, for 10, 20, I, I doubt a full hour, but you're talking good periods of time and you're talking really strong forces and of course you've got premature contacts and these premature contacts they're annoying and of course when you get something annoying you, you almost want to grind on it because you know it's there you know in a way possibly you're trying to push these premature contact down as you would if your teeth were biting together likely for long periods of time and of course your muscles these muscles, we're talking about the joint closing muscles or any of the muscles of mastication, are not really set up for having your teeth together. Remember, they're set up for your teeth being slightly apart, as is the jaw joint. So they're not really well designed for you bringing your teeth in contact, bringing your teeth together. And also, you're only doing this part time. If you hold your teeth together all of the time, of course, the body would reform to this position, but you don't. Maximum, you might have one, two hours in a day or if you're going to the night, through the night. But this isn't enough to, to stimulate change, but it's plenty enough to cause damage, way enough to cause damage. And of course, this huge force you're putting across, you're crushing your skull together, it's going to cause muscle ischemia, because the muscles can't, they're not stopping, they're just switched on, that's it. Nothing switching them off, it's a completely pathological situation. They never get switched off. Or, they don't switch off as much. You can consciously switch them off, or the overloading mechanism will switch them off, but that's a very high load. And so the, you get ischemia. You, you, the blood flow doesn't move in there, so you can get a lot of pain just in the muscles themselves. But of course, you're crushing your whole skull. You're, 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 you're holding all of the sutures in a... Um, in a position, in a compressed position for long periods of time. There's no blood flow going in. You could easily close off little veins and arteries passing through. Um, you lot cause lots of, you know, a lot. You potentially could cause lots of problems. And I'm interested in this concept of the movement of the plates of the skull and the acting as a pump for the cerebrovascular system. But I, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's true. I, I've heard a lot of people saying it's a load of nonsense, and I've heard a lot of people giving good grounds or suggestion towards it. Um, however, if you're clenching closed all the time, and the system does work, it's clearly not going to work very well. And the classic example of this is when people are going to sleep. You're, you're, you're trying to go to sleep, you're lying down, and of course a lot of those stresses that come from a modern society are coming in your head. You start clenching a little bit, and I think a little bit of clenching is not abnormal. I think a clench your muscles a little bit, it, it, that's a normal thing to do. But you should have a regulation, you should have a control, a governor of the system, so that when you clench, it's regulated. It's not unregulated. This is where the problem starts. And of course, we, we then come on to cure. What are you going to do about this? Well, realistically, you need to get your top tongue on top of the roof of your mouth. And I'm not talking about the tip waste of time. People told me constantly, oh, I've got my tongue in the roof of my mouth, ah, I can feel it. Tip, forget it. You've got to get the posterior third of your tongue up and fully engaged up. It's the posterior tongue that gets you good head posture too. That's got to be fully engaged and that comes up on the soft palate, acts as, you know, the tent, um, um, your trampoline up on the back there. You've got to get your tongue out from between your teeth. 
All right, it's part of getting it on the roof of the mouth, so the teeth can come together. So the teeth can rest in or near contact. Um, you've got to, um, this will lead to reorganization of the jaw joint and of course the muscles around it. And over time, you've got to rebuild this governor feedback mechanism. So you've got to have a feedback mechanism. You get to gain control again. You've lost control, you've got to regain control. And also you've got to gain a butterfly bite. So the teeth should rest in or near contact. But if they rest in or near contact, with the regulatory system working, you, you're not going to get problems. This is how they're supposed to rest. And the whole concept we have in a modern society, I mean, I, I even question the concept of a freeway space, but that's another lecture for another day, as is jaw joint issues. But I do think teeth should be in or near contact. They should be resting in butterfly bite. And that is a real controversy, that's one thing. I'm saying people who are dealing with clinching and bruxism are saying, no, no, you, you, you're, you're leading people to do the wrong thing. Now, remember, don't forget the tropic premise. There's more just to good oral posture than having tongue on the roof of the mouth. You've got to um, gain good, you've got to follow the tropic premise, um, preferably with good body posture as well. And we know we can produce conditioned reflex responses. When someone jumps out in front of me when I'm driving, I don't run them over. I yet, I yet to run anyone over. And the reason is I put my foot on the brake. And I do that without thinking. So this is a conditioned reflex response. Now I know that the, uh, the, these are now all cranial conditioned reflex response. I mean, we're way above the level of the spine here, even with the, uh, the chewing muscles on the tongue. But the still same process occurs. The same wiring exists, even if it looks different. And I know that when someone jumps in front of me, I hit the brake. I don't think about it. I frequently do it when I'm sitting in my passenger seat and my brother's driving, which is scary enough. And my foot hits the floor. Now, I'm not even driving, so it must be a conditioned reflex response. And I know I've built that response over time, because I wasn't born like that. So we know we can achieve conditioned reflex responses, but of course we need to work on those. Those don't come easily. Um, you know, uh, David Beckham has constructed some conditioned reflex response by continued practice. Any sportsman does the same thing. When you constantly do the same thing, you are building conditioned reflex responses. That's the whole purpose of practice. My concern really is you need the tongue space to do it, because if you don't have tongue space, you're going to struggle. It's very hard to assume a position that's uncomfortable and I believe the primary driver of comfort is your airway. So to maintain an uncomfortable position against your airway for any period of time is going to be difficult. And of course, not having tongue space is probably the definition of discomfort. Um, I hope that's helpful. Um, I haven't previously, but I'm going to start engaging in some of the discussion below here. Um, I'm concerned with some of the professional people who come on saying, oh, this isn't true, because I'd say to them, well, come up with an alternative hypothesis. There don't seem to be any hypothesis. No one seems to be thinking. No one seems to be putting things together to come up with philosophies or ideas. When I, one of my pet hobbies is just looking at documentaries, particularly sort of physics and astrophysics, I love, you know, looking about, you know, hearing about what they think is going on on some of these asteroids and things. Now, one thing is you have uh, researchers and you have theorists, and I think that makes a good balanced science. Where are the theorists in orthodontics and much of medicine? Well, we don't have them. We just have experimenters who, because they've done an experiment, are allowed to lord it over everyone else and say, this is how it is. Well, I'm being a theorist here. I'm putting forward a hypothesis for discussion, and I expect constructive discussion, um, polite constructive discussion. We've also put a few websites you might find useful if you want to go to some of the more source materials, some deeper discussions of this. Um, thank you very much for watching.